I'm Bill Mould, and this video is a scientific investigation into what causes corrosion of aluminum nipples in bicycle wheels when used with carbon composite rims. If you are an internet troll and you hope to find this amusing and entertaining, you might as well stop watching right now. Here are some ugly sights of galvanic corrosion. This is a photo from a wheel that I had to repair, and every single nipple in the rim evidenced this kind of excessive corrosion. In working on this problem, I was referred to this paper here, a doctoral dissertation, which has some 350 pages in it. This proved to be an excellent resource. Uh, the uh, link is there at the bottom if you're interested in digging it out. As an overview, we will look at what is galvanic corrosion, what is the chemistry, what factors increase the reaction rate, and what steps might mitigate the problem. Let's go into what we mean by galvanic corrosion. We're going to look at this as an anode-cathode reaction, not that much different from a typical battery. In an anode-cathode reaction, the anode donates electrons and the cathode accepts electrons. Here are the basics of a galvanic cell. We have a tank partly filled with an electrolyte, and immersed in that uh, is an anode and a cathode, which will be two different metals. The anode will be a more reactive metal, and the cathode a less reactive metal. Electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, and through the electrolytes, ions can flow in both directions. This is what's called a galvanic series. Over on the right, we have more reactive metals, and those are known as less noble or the least noble and are anodic, which means they typically form the anode. Aluminum alloy is a good example. On the left, we have less reactive metals. They're the most noble, and they are cathodic, and graphite is an example of those. But of course, graphite is not really a metal, but it's acting like one in these reactions. So in this galvanic reaction, we're looking at aluminum nipples giving up electrons to graphite. Let's just say that I try to describe this reaction as simply the transfer of electrons from the anode, which is the uh, nipple, to the cathode, which is the carbon composite rim. So we can envision our reaction starting with aluminum anode giving up electrons to the carbon composite cathode like this. An atom of aluminum becomes an aluminum ion and gives up three electrons and those electrons are absorbed quickly by the cathode. So Aluminum gives up three electrons, which are accepted by the cathode. The problem is, if those electrons just accumulate in the cathode, then an electric charge, a negative one, will quickly form, and no more electrons will be accepted from the aluminum, and the reaction would stop. Since the reaction does not stop, and since there is also no evidence that the cathode or the rim itself is undergoing a chemical reaction, then the cathode in this reaction here, as shown, has to in turn be giving up electrons to something else which is undergoing a chemical reaction. If we look at an abbreviated listing of some activities of, of uh, common materials, we can see um, the cause of the problem the more reactive materials are at the top there where it says the reactive vent anode and less reactive is on the bottom half of this scale. So this is a bad situation here where we have in group two a reactive metal, aluminum and aluminum alloys, but down in group four where we have much less reactive metals including graphite. Now, instead of using aluminum nipples, if we use brass, we would be down here in the same activity uh, category as, um, as graphite. So we wouldn't have a problem with 
brass nipples, but heaven forbid that we do that because they are slightly heavier and that is a perception problem at least. Uh, notice that titanium is down here also. Titanium uh, would not react with graphite either. However, um, I have no experience with titanium nipples. I don't know anybody that uh, has experience, but I believe they exist. They're probably pretty expensive and there may be metallurgical problems uh, besides associated with titanium. Now let's take a look at some of the relevant chemistry. If you're a little rusty on your chemistry, don't worry about it. You'll still be able to understand the concept, which is probably what's most important. There are two possible corrosion mechanisms. The first of these is shown here, which involves the splitting of a water molecule. The second is the reduction of oxygen. Both of these reactions result in the formation of aluminum hydroxide, which is the most likely corrosion product in the corrosion of aluminum. This is a chemical study on the oxidation products, and if we look in this column here where it says atomic concentrations, these are percentages. I have 74.44% oxygen atoms and 23.52% aluminum atoms, and if I look at this ratio of oxygen to aluminum, I get 3.16, and that's pretty close to the formula percentages of and relationship of three oxygen to every one aluminum. The fact that the hydrogen does not show up is not significant. Of these two mechanisms, the reduction of oxygen is the most probable, so I want to spend a few minutes going into the chemistry of that. This is the wheel we're going to look at. This is the spoke bed. This is the outer wall. And this is the edge of the rim. We put a rim tape on the wheel, a tire. The darker part is the, is the tread. We have a very thin layer of water on the inside of the spoke bed. And here's our valve stem. Let's do some labeling of this magnified view. This is our spoke bed, which is the carbon composite. A very, very thin layer of liquid water. And when we say thin, this could be just a few microns or millions of a meter in thickness. Unpressurized air, the outer rim wall, the rim tape, and pressurized air here and the tire tread here. Well, almost immediately we start having a problem because there are holes, of course, through the spoke bed, and those holes have sharp corners. So my nipple starts out looking like this, but after I screw the nipple on farther and farther, get more and more friction, I eventually will get a ring, as you can see here, where the anodized coating has rubbed off the nipple. Now the corrosion begins here where the aluminum, the unprotected aluminum metal, which is a pretty reactive metal, starts the reaction by giving up uh, three electrons and becoming the aluminum ion. The majority of carbon composite materials are made up of sheets of carbon atoms uh, like this the rest of it being the resin, but the majority is these carbon sheets. And if you look, you see that there are alternating single and double bonds in this structure, and that makes the graphite-like material a pretty good conductor of electricity. As the aluminum is oxidized, the electrons in enormous numbers flow into the rim. In this first portion of the corrosion, reactions, aluminum is acting as the anode and the carbon composite rim is acting as the cathode. Now look at these components and you will see that the surface area of the nipple is very small compared to the surface area of the rim. And this has very severe implications because um, the importance of this geometry is significant a very large cathode area, which we have, connected to a very small anode area, which we have, is the most unfavorable ratio in most practical corrosion situations. 
where they meet atmospheric oxygen molecules, which have dissolved into the thin water layer. Now, if you were to look in a high school chemistry book, you would see an oxygen molecule looking something like this, where we have a double bond between oxygen atoms. But oxygen really only has a single bond, and these single electrons here make oxygen a, a radical, in fact, a di-radical, and make it highly reactive. So we combine that oxygen molecule with four of those abundant electrons, which are in the rim, and that will split the oxygen molecule into two oxide ions, each of which has a charge of minus two. The oxide ions will pull a hydrogen off a water molecule, and that gives us two hydroxide ions. In the last step, the aluminum ions combine with hydroxide ions and form aluminum hydroxide, which is the most probable compound produced in the oxidation. So again, the reaction begins by electrons from the nipple, which is the anode, going into the rim, which is the cathode. But the carbon rim has no use for keeping these electrons, so in the second part, then the carbon becomes the anode and gives up electrons to the oxygen, which is the cathode. So the carbon material is really acting as a conduit here. It's accepting electrons from aluminum and turning around and giving them to oxygen. So the carbon is a, a key part of this, but is not itself a net reactant. And I think the evidence shows this. If you look at one of these wheels where the aluminum nipples have excessively corroded, like the picture I showed you, the rim itself appears to be unaffected and could be built into another wheel right away. Now we're going to look at what factors increase the reaction rate and what steps might mitigate the problem. Now without getting too complicated, I want to mention something called thermodynamics versus kinetics. Thermodynamics determine if a corrosion process can occur, and kinetics will determine how fast the corrosion will occur. Kinetics often prevail over thermodynamics, and a good example of that is hydrogen gas with oxygen gas forming liquid water. And this is the chemical equation, and it occurs by giving off a very large amount of heat, which means that it's thermodynamically a very favorable reaction. But the kinetics are extremely slow, and the reaction won't take place in your lifetime without a spark. This is our very, very thin water layer, and this is where the reaction between the electrons and dissolved oxygen is taking place, as shown in more detail down here. Now, in that very thin water layer, we also have carbon dioxide molecules going into solution, and that creates a series of uh, equations down here water and carbon dioxide combine to form in an equilibrium reaction carbonic acid and that in turn will break down into the hydrogen ion and the bicarbonate ion so we have ions in solution also and hydrogen ion which makes a very weak acid solution for that same reason rain is slightly acidic and some rain will certainly work its way down into this area uh, where the reaction is taking place. And besides that, there are road salts. And there is a theory about the off-gassing from tires complicating and accelerating this uh, reaction that we're seeing. Although this uh, effect of off-gassing from tires is not very well understood. We may be able to mitigate this problem of corrosion a little bit by use of some washers. These are some of the washers I frequently use, and these are made by Supim. And this one down here in the corner, the HM washer, may offer us some help. 
Here's one of the washers ready to take its place right under the head of the nipple. There is a perfect congruent fit between the bowl-shaped head of the supine polyaxial nipple and the curvature of the washer. And the washer will protect the nipple from being scored. And for the weight weenies out there, the mass of one Supreme HM washer is only 0.17 grams. You saw this picture a minute ago where the nipple on the left is, is a braided, where the nipple is making contact directly with the rim. Um, maybe we can uh, improve that situation by using a washer under the head of the nipple. This would be another picture of the same thing. What about using nipples other than those made from aluminum alloy? Aluminum is very reactive, and when it's in direct contact with graphite, we have a bad situation for corrosion. I would be far better off with brass nipples if I could accept a small amount of increased weight, or possibly using titanium nipples. Here are some titanium nipples shown in a picture. Most of us who build wheels have no experience with titanium nipples, but these are 12 millimeter nipples, and right off the bat, 12 millimeters is going to be too short for a carbon composite rim. You really need 14 millimeter nipples for that. Um, I think there is probably very limited availability and options. They're quite expensive, I believe. The metallurgical properties are a little bit unknown, and also compatibility with wheel building robotic machines possibly would be a concern. What about eyelets? In this picture here at the top, we have our simplified galvanic cell, and we have a direct connection between the anode and the cathode. And if we look at the, the good and bad designs below of uh, two uh, pieces of metal being held together with a bolt, on the right we have a bad design because they are in direct contact, whereas the one on the left, there is an insulated bushing that separates the two metals from each other. Maybe we could do that here. Here is that same part magnified. I take out the nipple, revealing a hole in the spoke bed just large enough to accommodate the nipple. Now I drill a larger hole in the spoke bed and put a bushing in the hole and then the nipple inside the bushing. The bushing would have to be strong enough to survive the force put on it by the friction between the nipple and the, and the spoke when the uh, tension gets high. So it couldn't be some flimsy liner. And besides that, you might have problems with uh, wheel building machines. It adds a little bit of weight to the wheel and probably would increase the amount of time it would take to build a wheel. So there you have it, a proposed explanation and mechanism for the corrosion of aluminum nipples when used in carbon composite wheels. That alone, however, does not solve the problem because we still need a practical method for eliminating it, although such a solution may not exist. I welcome viewers of this video paper to contact me with any comments or suggestions. And here is my contact information. Thank you for watching.